Welcome back, everyone. This is episode 139 of the Jiu-Jitsu Dummies podcast. We're brought to you by Black Belt Digital Marketing. Anything you need to build your business on or offline, website design, Google ads, reputation management is our claim to fame, getting local businesses found. Uh, we can absolutely help with anything you need. Check us out at Black Belt Digital Marketing on Instagram or our website, which is bbdigitalmarketing.com. You can go on that website, request a free review of your online presence, um, give you like an entire scan of where your business stands online. It's really interesting. My name is Milton Campus. I'm a black belt training out of South Florida. We got Christian behind the camera. Woo! <laughs> no Bo today. Bo's going to do the final cut, but he's not in the studio today. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, download, share, and click that subscribe button. We'd really appreciate all the support. So thank you, everybody. We just hit 15K on Instagram, which is a big deal for us. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody. Again, thank you for the support. Moving real quick. Hopefully, uh, we'll be at 20 pretty quick. Uh, joining us today are Mike and Sheena Bidwell. We're going to bring them in a second. They're from BJJ After 40. Um, I know that you're going to be familiar once you see their faces. A uh, quick few shout-outs here. We're going to shout out, uh, first of all, Flow and Roll. Been with us from the very beginning. We just finished a belt giveaway, so thank you, everybody, who... Uh, who submitted for the uh, the giveaway, tagged their friends, did all that fun stuff. You can go check them out at flow underscore n underscore roll on IG, or you can visit their website at flowandroll.com. You get 20% off of your orders with code JJD. And although we've been talking about the embroidered belts that they do, they've got an incredible pre-order program. If you've got a... Um, uh, if you've got a new gym or you need to stock up in your gym, there's a, they've got a great, really interesting way of helping you get your gear... You don't have to lay out a lot of money out of pocket, and um, you know your your students can actually order your stuff online, and it'll get sent directly to them. They get a bag with it. They get you know probably some stickers and patches and some extra things here once in a while. So just check them out again. Flowandroll.com, twenty percent off with code JJD. Also, Leo Optics. Where are my sunglasses? Let me put my sunglasses on. These are my favorites. They keep us in shades. Leo Optics is a sunglass and apparel company specializing in these signature bamboo sunglasses. Uh, I love this, right? If uh, we can see that, right? I got these before I was a black belt, but they usually send them out with the red stripe. Uh, you can request your belt stripe here on the inside. Uh, they have bamboo. They have other styles too, but they're known for their bamboo sunglasses. Their passion is rooted in the jiu-jitsu lifestyle. It's founded in Southern California, and their products reflect the BJJ lifestyle. So go check them out. I think Mike and Sheena, Mike, I think Mike, I think I've seen you working with them, right? I know we put you into a couple of posts on our on our page. You can visit their website at leooptics.com and use code JJD for 10% off. Uh, who else do we got here? We've got uh, Bioprotein Technology. This is a bioidentical alternative to human growth hormone. I've been using this now for probably, what, uh, six, nine months, somewhere in that range. Uh, I did get blood work done recently. My HGH is up tremendously over about a year and change ago. Um, so this is the only thing that I change in that regard. So uh, BioPro helps you with anti-aging, metabolism, libido, immune system, skin cognition, as well as sleep and stress. So I've got the core to sleep and the regular. So the core to sleep I take at night and then the regular one I take in the morning before breakfast. You want to take it on an empty stomach and look, it's just a little vial. Shake it up, put it under the tongue for 90 seconds. It's great. No needles, no side effects. And you can check them out at bioproteintech.com. You get $30 off with code JJD on any of their regularly priced kits. So basically, you, you'll be buying two kits. You get 30 bucks off. All right? All right, that's it. Let's do this. Let's uh, get Mike and Sheena in here. I kept it to, I kept it to under four minutes. <laughs> Welcome, guys. I am so happy. You got Mike, let me just tell you, you're one of my favorite guys to talk to and follow online. So great to have you back. And uh, um, it's very nice to meet you, Sheena. I know we only spoke by phone once, but... Uh, you, I mean, the smiles on your face are like just so inviting and soothing. <laughs> no, no, so, wait, hold on. So congratulations on your black belt. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I very much appreciate that, man. Um, you know, you know, a lot of hard work, and I truly understand. And uh, that whole like now the journey begins. I always thought that was so corny and like yeah, whatever. But, uh, you know, now it's like I see the, exp I, you know, even on the lead up, I started going to the gym more. I was like, when I get this, I'm going to have earned it. I don't want to just get my black belt because the amount of time I was going more. I was going through some personal stuff. So it was like my, you know, it was like, uh, you know, helped me mentally. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I do feel that extra it, good pressure in my mind. Like I feel that extra um, like you got to live up to this now. You, you want to say you're a black belt. You can't, you know. It's no, yeah, it's there's like, no, no days off, no taking off, no slacking, you know? 
yeah, like a sense of responsibility to it yeah. now, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, but it's a beautiful thing, man. I I do feel like the journey has just begun, and now I got to keep, you know, trying to keep up. You know, look, we're, you know, you guys, uh, you're, I, you know, you're. I don't want to say you're most known, but you're definitely known for the BJJ After Forty brand. Uh, so definitely been following. I started at forty one. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's who better to talk to than you about this stuff? Sheena, yes. I'm, I'm not going to guess how old you are, Sheena. I don't, are you over forty as well? Am I allowed to ask that? Is that okay? I'm forty one. Okay. But I started the Mike's fifteen years older than me, so I've been BJJ after. Look at 40. that! Look at Mike's smile. He's like, yeah, that's right. It's been a minute going on to this though. Yeah. Like, it started BJJ after 40 started way before then for, for yeah, me. Because she's been hearing about, you know, I'll be 55 in May. So she's been hearing about BJJ after 40 for the last 15 years. Yeah. Did, were you so, guys together already when the brand started, when you started this? Yeah. And I mean, you, I, I don't know if there was purpose behind it. Did No one ever thinks that something like that is going to turn into what it's turned into for you. Was there purpose no, behind so, it? Was it purposeful? In some ways, like, you know, it's, we've always been about, purpose instead of outcome, you yeah. know, like, yeah, I'm cheesy about it, but it's the truth. Like I never looked at BJJ after 40 as being anything other than like a great community for people to connect and a place to like share jujitsu for people over 40 that I think it was going to be as big as it is now. No, I didn't okay. think so. But you know, I do, I, I, uh, you know, it was always kind of in my heart hoping that it would like, you know, blow up and, yeah. get, you know, give give something back to jujitsu right yeah that seed of being able for at the time mike approaching his 40s and saying i need to do this differently like i yeah. i love this so much and he wasn't a black belt at the time so it was like as a brown belt who was at that kind of tipping point of i either need to do this differently so i can continue or mm -hmm. i i can't do it like we both had to find a way for him to personally be able to practice jujitsu and then we were able to after a while be like oh let's share some things that have been working for you and see if it resonates with anybody else so yeah it started there and has been going ever since well the value for you was that you experienced bjj before 40 like you got to the benefit of like helping me and figuring all of this out in your thirties, instead of waiting until like you're 40 and you're like, yeah. Oh shit. Like, how am I going to do jujitsu jiu differently now mm -hmm. without losing all of the things that I love about jujitsu too. Right. Yeah. 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 Did you guys, I know that we probably talked about this, Mike. we're going to, we're going to talk like we've never spoken before because not you everybody's know, listened to everyone. Right. So <laughs> did you guys meet on the mats? Were you already doing jujitsu Sheena or were you, did you just, you meet and then, He's like, hey, check this thing out that I do. How did that work? Yeah, I, I was already in stand-up martial arts at the time. And so Mike and I did meet on the mats through martial arts. Okay. It was stand-up, though. It was Taekwondo. It was not jujitsu. No, it was traditional martial arts. But then right. the second we started dating, it got, you know, it got hot and heavy and quick. Kind of when we met, like we were, <laughs> you know. Immediately. Immediately, <laughs> like pretty much we knew we were always going to be together, you know. We just yeah. kind of knew. So like right away, she was doing jujitsu with me. So when she, you've been doing jujitsu for 20 years, like plus, like what, how, how long was it for you from white to, to black? And I, and I was there, I promoted her all the way through too. Like her blue belt, her purple, her brown and her black belt. Like she's my first black belt. Yeah. So 39, um, I think. So yeah. really. <laughs> was there ever time you said you knew you guys going to be together as a, uh, as someone who is relatively new i guess newly single um i think about it's you know i'm out there dating and i'm when i'm talking to women i'm talking about like you don't have to do this but i need you to be passionate about something that that's like healthy either the gym yeah. or martial arts like it's if there was a checklist i'm like my part of my checklist is like i need you to do something or be as into something as me. Like I'm, I don't want to, I hate to use the word obsessed, but like, I'm going to be on the mats as long as I can. Like you guys are saying, right. Um, yeah. it's, it's a requirement for me to meet somebody that does this or something like it or that, that passionate, let me use that word. You're that passionate about something that's physical, that's keeping you healthy and in shape. Does that make sense? Right. Oh my God. It yeah. only makes sense because I, 
before before Sheena, I was I was married before, and you know I had come off from a, a divorce, but I didn't have a partner before that was like into like martial arts, and they don't have to necessarily be into martial arts, but like had a passion about fitness or anything yeah. like that. So when Sheena and I connected through martial arts, I think that was like we both were like excited to have a partner that was into something that we that each was passionate about, right? Yeah, absolutely, and and you know the difference in the quality of person you are and who you as yourself bring to the relationship when you are actively mentally, emotionally engaging in your well-being and yeah. the person that you're with, of course you want that reciprocated. So yeah. it's it's definitely an okay ask for yeah, even just like, yeah, I think what you said, Milton, is important. Like something that you're passionate about because if you're not passionate about something and it doesn't always have to be like your career too, it could be something that you just love. Like it could be fitness, maybe yeah. not fit. It could be into painting or music or something, but I think it's important as, you know, partners to support each other in the things that you are passionate about or the things that you want to have in your life. And what's amazing about jujitsu is yes, it is uh, the mental and the emotional, the, but it's the physical chess and yeah. yeah you are in a relationship with somebody that you care about and their physical being isn't there, how can you be in a relationship with them? So yeah. having an outlet for them to, in a healthy way, get their energy out, have their muscles uh, growing and, and- Their mental energy as well. Yeah. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. challenging your mind, all of the great things that we love about jujitsu. Right, yeah. yeah. How How hard is it? I'm looking for the advice here. How hard is it to you were you were dating you were going to somebody else's gym doing ta doing taekwondo when you met, right? You weren't this wasn't your own gym, so you're at somebody else's gym and you are um you're training together. When it got to the jujitsu side, Mike, that was your gym. When you well, see here, it's even well, it's kind of even crazier than that. So okay, I, I came out. So we're, we live in Colorado. Our school's in Colorado. I came out here in the early 2000s. I had a jiu-jitsu school in Delaware at that point. Okay. And I came out here with a couple uh, jiu-jitsu guys for a martial arts marketing boot camp. Okay. And the school that was hosting the boot camp was the school that she trained at. <laughs> and yeah, right? <laughs> so I believe yeah, I guess everything happens well, for a reason, right? What's that? Everything happens for a reason, right? Like there's, you know. This is our origin story. Yeah. <laughs> But basically, like, so I came out for this boot camp. Um, she was working at the Taekwondo school that was hosting this thing. And I we, I went to that school, like, uh, to visit a uh, day before, like, the actual boot camp started. They had the, all the martial arts school owners could come down and tour the school. And they did, like, a presentation and stuff. And she was working at the front desk. And I come into the school, and she's working. I was like, wow, this girl's pretty hot. <laughs> on my eye right away. And so me being the, the witty, witty guy that I am, she's like, can you go ahead and sign the book here? And I signed the book, David Berkowitz. Do you know who David Berkowitz? Yeah, <laughs> yes, right. I know who it is. <laughs> right, AKA the son of Sam. Yeah. I thought that that was funny. So what did you say? Well, I didn't know who that was. So I was like, how do you spell Berkowitz? <laughs> I mean, it's... it's... <laughs> yeah, how do you spell Berkowitz? And so... Yeah, so that was how the whole thing started. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've, I've been the joker ever since. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's how we met. And we were, you know, talking throughout the weekend of this boot camp. And it's kind of like, it's kind of funny because it's like a freaking uh, romantic comedy. Um, the last night of the boot camp, like we hadn't like, you know, exchanged numbers or anything, but we were like talking and stuff. And I was getting ready to leave the boot camp to go out with a bunch of jujitsu guys that wanted to, wanted to go to a club or something. So we're pulling out of the parking lot. I was like, hey, stop the car. They're like, why? I'm like, I'm going to go back and look for that girl. It's the last night. I'm going to find that girl. So I go back in the hotel. I'm running down the halls. We bump into each other. We start hanging out and exchange phone numbers. And next thing you know, she's like in Delaware living with me and training jujitsu. And that's kind of how it started. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's great. So yeah. I, I, it it inspires me. Um, I'll say my last relationship was the woman was wonderful, but yes. uh, I always say that uh, my work, which includes this, mm -hmm. and by default jujitsu itself, was like the other woman. It was yeah. um, it was mm -hmm. I was doing this without her. Um, it was almost like 
well, you go and have fun when you talk to people. Like, so it was less work. It wasn't work. Right. This is like your hobby, but it was turning into work. It was, you know, becoming profitable. And now, you know, it honestly, um, it helps us get business. We're a sponsor. My company's a sponsor. The marketing company, Black Belt, is a sponsor. And we get business from it. Then, so I get to talk to people. The sponsors are paying us. I get clients from my other company from it. And I have, and I love jujitsu, right? So it's just like, she just kind of never saw that. And it was always like a sore spot. I needed that support. And it was more like, um, you know, like we're, we weren't on a team. It was like we were adversaries. And this was like the thing that we were arguing about, which led to, you know, always leads to other things. So now I'm sitting here going, you know, uh, it's funny. Me and Christian always, uh, Christian got me on the, the dating apps. Christian, our producer here is just like, you got to get on the dating apps. <laughs> and I did it. But it's like, again, it's, um, I've met some great women, but I'm always like, you know, it comes back to, you know, what do you do for fun? Or, you know, do you train? Do you go to the gym? And I want to say it's, I, I, you know, I want people to understand this is not about me finding some like fitness model. I mean, like, actually, that's not what I want. Right. It's about the health. I, I think more than anything for me, it's the healthy, you know, the healthy lifestyle that you have to have to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. You got to remember, I had a heart attack when I was 43. So like, this mm. is even more important to me to live healthy, um, you know, to, to eat healthy food and shop at Whole Foods. Like, you know, mm. I've had women like, oh, Whole Foods is too expensive. I'm not going to shop there. I'm like, it, don't you want me alive longer? Right. You know, like I just need somebody by default that that's just like, oh yeah, of course that's a given. Right. So mm -hmm. I, again, you know, I go back to, I really feel like it needs to be someone that really not only understands the fitness side, but ideally if I found somebody in jujitsu would be great. Cause again, my, I named my company at basically after jujitsu, I've got the podcast, you know, it does. And if I'm not doing this, I'm at the gym. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it's becoming even more and more important. Um, I'm leading to the question of when you guys are on the mat, like how difficult is it? to like watch your wife maybe roll with another in the beginning let's say in the beginning like okay she's training with guys and like you yeah. know guys in, in the, but I, and i should say this like in my gym we haven't always done this but we've very much done this for the last few years is the women train by themselves like that we train on the same map but the women usually roll with the women the guys roll with the guys it wasn't always like that uh definitely you know i'm a i'm a bigger guy i'm 230 so most of the women just aren't a good fit for a good role with me uh, it's probably not great for either one of us. Um, I shouldn't maybe say that, I, you know, uh, they might think that it's not a great role for them. So they, why would they want to roll with a guy that's almost double their size, but just watching your girlfriend at the time rolling with men, did that bother you? Did, is it something that you had to get used to? So I've seen like both sides of it. Cause Sheena, even when we were doing jujitsu together, like there were schools that like we trained at where she was doing Muay Thai and doing MMA classes. And yeah. I watched guys like, literally punched my wife in the face mm. and that honestly like I, i'd be lying if i said no nah, like you know she's her own person she can handle it like of course she could handle it but i had more trouble handling some of that honestly like i couldn't even watch her take muay thai and mma classes but with jujitsu i've never really kind of felt that way with you and other men um and i've seen sheena go through like all all the stages of all the belts you know yeah. and and watch her like the struggles that like, you know, everybody faces, but the particular struggles that like females, females face and, you know, grappling with bigger guys and all of that. So I never felt like that uncomfortable with the jujitsu aspect of it. I don't anymore because she's a black belt now and like she can, you know, she's an ass kicker. So I don't even have to think about that now. It's more funny just to watch her like kill a bigger guy than <laughs> nowadays. Um, but, you know, it does. That's never really bothered me. How, how do you feel about uh, yeah. that? ever felt like uncomfortable with that with guys well or? i get what you're saying about the the difference in size and yeah. the difference in just the vibe and the culture in the school we yeah. have been at academies where uh it's not really condoned for uh, a lower belt me at the time to walk up to maybe an upper belt who's a lot bigger than me and uh say hey let's we're gonna roll now you know yeah uh it might be more acceptable for me to just roll with the women versus at other schools. Or smaller people. Yeah, I, sure. I think, and I think it comes down to that for me more than anything is like the size. Like, you know, we would all love to think that, you know, oh, size doesn't matter in jujitsu, but we all know that's not true. Like, you know, when all other things are equal, size 
you know, is and a strength, right? Strength comes into play as well, right? So, so doesn't speed. So doesn't like, you know, flexibility, like there's different attributes that are going to be, you know, overwhelming, but mm-hmm. weight alone is a big one. It's not yeah. even, you know, it's like when someone has, there's, I always feel like there's about a 50 pound threshold. Like if someone is like more than 40 or 50 pounds bigger, like it's just good. You know, it's, you can have fun with the role, but there's still going to be like, there can be somewhat of a safety issue. Like if you're a bigger dude and you come down on just even passing the guard, your knee comes down on her leg hard, you know, you can jack somebody up pretty easily. you like, you know, even with the two of us, like I always have to remind myself, there's like always going to be like 50, 60 pound weight difference. Like we have a weight difference in us. And so when I roll with Sheena, I have to be very cognizant of like, you know, like that there's certain things that I'm not trying to do, you know, versus like if I roll with someone who's my size, I can, you know, feel a little bit better about like, you know, trying to smash them and that kind of thing. How do you feel about that, Sheena? What are, what are your thoughts on on that? Well, so because like, let, let me let me preface. Can I preface that with something like I know that sometimes when I've said that in front of somebody, male or female, they get a little annoyed if I'm uh, kind of saying like I'm taking it a little bit easier on you because of your size. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Right. Sure. Yeah. And that's, you know, everybody has their own way that they're going to get through working through. How am I going to deal with uh, saying no to this person mm-hmm. or setting this okay. boundary or figuring out what is best for me? And that has to come down to like Mike is saying, if you outweigh me, literally my person doubly, uh, what's the point in us getting together and trying to smash it out for yeah. for five minutes versus is it a better use of our time, of our partnership, of our teamwork together to uh, do something differently, to roll differently, to drill, to anything so that you and I can mutually be teammates, partners, work together, but it doesn't have to be in this uh, pre-structured way Mm -hmm. that this is the only answer and this is the only path that you can take. I feel like you can go about this training in a way with whoever you want to train with, Uh, but with setting those perfect boundaries for yourself. So if it is somebody like if I weigh under 130 pounds and you weigh over 230 pounds, right? Like um, let's do what's going to be best for both of us, not have an an ego match, right? Maybe it's not rolling. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah, maybe it's just drilling. Maybe whatever. Like why why does it have to be that we have to roll? We could still... (laughs) train and work together <laughs> for me, male or female, I'm usually going to pull guard on somebody who's smaller. Um, mm-hmm. and I always tell people, I still do this now and I know mm-hmm. who to do it with and who not to do it with in my gym is mm-hmm. I tell them like, you have control of the accelerator here. We're going to go mm-hmm. as hard and as fast as you, you're going to start Like, you know, you, that, Hey, let's flow. And then the flow all of a sudden starts escalating, escalating. And now you're in like a full battle and it's like ADCC finals. Right. And, yeah. and that happens. So like, I usually, you know, whether it's set or unset, I usually let them control the pace. Um, and for me, you know, I've been doing this long enough now that I know I'm going to pull guard on somebody smaller. But listen, I pulled guard on somebody smaller and then they just go like not ham in a bad way. Like they're just their technique is on point, like a blue belt that's been training for five or six years on and off. I've got one of those in my gym. He does these yeah. flying knee cuts and I'm just like, oh, OK, well, maybe I'm not going to let you pass. But he's like much smaller than me. But I'll usually just take that opportunity to kind of work on my defense and, again, pull guard, let them work. If I am if I do roll with a, a smaller uh, a woman that's smaller, I'm always going to, like, okay, attack. And sometimes they'll, they've looked at me and been like, oh, my God, we're going to roll. And I'm like, don't worry. I'm going to just just work. And then I'll just, again, I'll pull guard and I'll be – and they're, they're like, I've come out of those roles and, and women have said, like, that was great because I, mm-hmm. I'm giving them I'm, – I'm matching their intensity. I'm not just giving them anything. But again, I'm cognizant of I might outweigh most of the women. I'm probably outweighing them by 100 pounds. So I mm-hmm. have to take that into consideration. I've been walking around at 230 for the longest time. I'm probably in like the low 220s right now. Still, average girl in my gym is under 130 pounds easily. And um, yeah, so it's, it's no fun for them. But again, you know, my gym, for the most part, we keep the women separate. On an open mat day, maybe there's only a couple of women and it's a bunch of guys. And sometimes it's been the other way around. It's like the, the class is full of women and there's only a couple of guys. So we wind up, you know, mixing and matching. So it does happen. But 
I think that anybody out there that's that's listening has to realize, like, it can't be just Hulk smash all the time. You know, you have to. Um, and, and I've had people be like, no, no, you, you got to. Yeah, they got to deal with it. You know, they, no, they got to deal with it. What if they get attacked on the street? And I'm like, but this isn't the street and we got to go to work tomorrow. You know, you, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to get hurt. Right. Don't break your toys because then nobody wants to play with you. Right. So, uh, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I say all those things to people and I and I, you know, I think that after a while, even the spazzy white belts that, you know, like they realize it. Um, in the beginning, when you try to tell them, like, okay, calm down, technique. Um, you know, I've got a couple of big guys that are white belts in my gym. I'm just like, okay, man, these guys are just like spazzy. I got my face hurts here on the side. I got a knee in the head the other day from a white belt. I was like, oh, geez, like just from like getting, he was getting side controlled, knee me in the head so hard. I mean, it happens, but you know, you don't want to be doing that, to, regardless of gender, you don't want to be doing that to anybody. Um, and then I like, I'm, even though I'm not a gym owner, I'm also uh, conscious of, we want them back tomorrow, especially when they're you know newer to the to the sport. We want them to come back tomorrow. We don't want to scare them out of the gym by smashing a, a new person or a smaller person, right? We've certainly had yeah. that happen, like with older people in my gym. Uh, even when I f- started at the gym that I'm at, at at Blue Belt, I was coming in beaten up. I was like in my early 40s, but we had guys that were like 60 years old and like white and blue belts. And they stopped coming. <laughs> it was like they were getting smashed by these young guys, and it's just like not fun. So I understand the business side of it as well, right? Not everybody is, is, uh, thinks like that. Like a lot of students don't think like that. They just, I want to go to the gym, and I want to roll hard, and I, I want to get my jiu-jitsu practice in, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the part of that, though, is is the strategy, like helping you as a student, helping your fellow students and instructors understand the name of the game. Yeah. If if this is a physical chess, it's not just about moving one of your pawns and that's it. You have to be able to eventually, right, capture everybody else's pieces, but move your queen as well. Like yeah. it has to be a strategy so that you're able to uh, have that that limit to say like, okay, maybe I don't roll with this person in, in the gym and that's okay. You don't yeah. have to yeah. roll with it single person and that's yeah. the magic of like the jujitsu toolbox like you have all of these different tools in your toolbox you don't always have to be the hammer yeah. you know what i mean sometimes you could be like what milton said you could pull guard and just maybe i'm going to work on my guard because this person is less experienced than me or for you as your own opportunity to like you know handicap yourself in certain ways i'm not going to use my arm i'm not going to use my legs or i'm just going to use my legs or I'm going to roll with my eyes closed or finding other ways to limit your own training so that you both can have something fun happening during the roll. And that's what I love about the jujitsu toolbox. There's a lot of different ways to play the game. It doesn't always have to be the hammer. What's your advice of both of these questions for both of you? So, and let's, let's start with Sheena because uh, I, I think a lot of women want it here. Like, how do you, hand, how do you say no to somebody, especially in a situation where it's like, it's a big guy I just don't want to roll with that person. And I've got to like, how do you import, how do you express that to them without offending them? And I mean, it, it's really for anyone, but like, I'd like to, you know, hear if, what is your advice to a woman who's just like, I don't want to roll with that person. How do I say it nicely where I'm not offending them and making it weird in the gym? Does that make sense? I would right. ideally recommend any woman to find a way where she can perform comfortably. So maybe she doesn't want to roll with them, would she be okay doing the move on them five times? Would they be okay drilling? Would they be okay in any scenario working together uh, so they can, once again, still have uh, the the time, the, the camaraderie of it all. Um, they still get work, but it doesn't have to be in this one specific parameter of like, all right, well, if we're not rolling, if we're not going, you know, 100%, then it's not going to happen. Maybe it's a time for them to redefine their relationship and uh, kind of get to the root of that insecurity where this is a chance for me to have an opportunity to, in a safe place, uh, let somebody know what feels good, what I'm interested yeah. in, what my needs or desires are, and then work through that safely on the mats. And then we can do that off the mats in the rest of our lives, right? Like, sure. isn't that the point of jujitsu is to have this help us with everything that we need. So if there isn't a guy who we're specifically like thrilled with rolling about, what is possible? What are we capable of doing with that person? And then if there's like, absolutely no way for it to happen it's okay to set that boundary and it starts with no thanks right or 
not today, maybe yeah. next time. Or I'm sitting out right now for this round. Thanks for asking. No, but thanks for asking. And that's yeah. okay to say too. Yeah, and if that's not, honestly, like I always feel like if that's not acceptable in the environment you're in, then it's like, then maybe you need to think about the environment you're in. Like that should be okay. Like I don't feel like if somebody, you know, like I, listen, you don't want to hide from the challenges of jujitsu. There's really, and there's no way to escape that anyhow. Like you're going to have to at some point, like you can't move forward without that. So. You know, I don't think if, you know, if, as long as you're not feeling like you're avoiding them because it's just like, you know, it's a tougher role. Like I like what Sheena mm -hmm. said, creating some parameters and doing it maybe a little bit differently. But I think it should be OK in any environment to be say no to certain people, like if it's just not your vibe or whatever. Yeah, I've given the advice before, and I think that this is um, uh, I'm going to probably expand on what Sheena just said, because I've given this advice even for people when they roll with me. Special thank you to the crew over at Flow and Roll for all their support. Flow and Roll is renowned for their incredible Nogi rash guards, shorts, and leggings. Flow and Roll has quickly become the premier custom apparel provider for academies big and small throughout the United States. Reach out today to discuss your custom order and ask about their incredible pre-order program. You can send an email to flowandroll at gmail.com or visit their Instagram at flow underscore n underscore roll and shoot them a direct message. And yes... They can create an awesome custom gi for your academy as well. Visit flowandroll.com to check out their awesome designs, and while you're there, pick up a jujitsu dummy signature tee exclusively at flowandroll.com. And remember, you'll get 20% off your purchase of t-shirts, rash guards, or gis with code JJD. For spazzy white belts, I'll, if I'm going to roll, I'm the black belt, and there's a spazzy white belt, I'll ask them if they want to work on something. Or, hey, just, hey, come here, hey, so, hey. Start in my guard. And then we, mm -hmm. we take it out. Uh, we start to take them out of that, like, well, I've got to pass this guard and i got to go really hard right now. We're in, like, a, even though I'm not a, a coach in my school, we get into this, like, kind of coach-student relationship. And then I can mm -hmm. kind of guide them. Hey, oh, look, you should put your leg here. And you start getting into this, this kind of teaching thing. And they realize, like, you're not, Mike, you said this, you said this on one of the other podcasts, like, I'm not someone that you have to get through. Do you remember, mm. you remember mentioning this? You used uh, Michael Jordan as the example. Right. You said like yes, Michael yes. Jordan didn't have to like play basketball with his coach every time and then right. like beat him to like, okay, now I can go out, uh, go, go out on the mat. It's not the goal to get through you. You're not somebody that they have to get through. So it's the same thing for me. Again, I don't own my school. I'm not a coach at my school, but I think it, it, we start to say that like, we don't, it's, we don't have to have this competition. Let's learn jujitsu. And you have a black belt in front of you, like ask some questions. Like it's a great advice for somebody who's or for also that white belt that's like, man, this guy just always beats me up. Well, when you get to that role, ask, hey, could we work on something? Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? Always ask. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Could we start here because I'm having a problem with this thing? And as soon as you get into that teacher student uh, role, whichever side it, it initiates it, it takes away that, well, somebody's got to win. And then right. now, and, and also like, especially if you're the new guy, doing that now you're getting to know your partners they're knowing that you're open to to take information anytime i'm giving somebody as the black belt giving somebody information or saying i always ask, can i show you something can i show you what you did wrong there always ask because i know i'm look i'm not their coach so i want to make sure they're okay with taking the information uh, i don't think anybody's ever said no but if i just get into like hey look you really got to put your arm here when you do it it's almost just like all right all right i get it you beat me up and, I, and you submit no no do you mind if i tell you and then same from the white belt, right? You know, hey, do you mind? Can we work on something? And I think just asking that permission is is kind of what it's helped me from either side. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, now, again, I, I deal with like a spazzy white belt. I'll use it like, hey, let's start in my guard. You start in my guard. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, I've even, I'll, I've rolled over. Like, I've just sat. R round starts, I've sat. And I've rolled over to my side so they can immediately take my back. And we're going to start from there. Uh, so I got, th those are some tips that I've given people and that I even use for myself. But again, I think take turning it into like this coaching relationship for whoever initiates it, I think is super useful, especially when, again, it's a spazzy guy on one side or it's like I'm getting beat up by that higher belt all the time. That's uh, that's something that I've done again in both cases. That's great advice. And I think from a teacher's perspective, too, like whenever I. If I'm going to roll with a, you know, a spazzy white belt, I always remind myself too, like, I, I've got to like protect myself. Like I got to do a lot of this and a lot yeah. of this and a lot of this because I don't want to catch a knee to my head. 
But I also like the idea of like what you were saying is for me to set some parameters with them too. Like, let's let's work on some of your technique. Let's help you out. Because I have to often remind myself, Sheena's been a great reminder for me that I am not the thing my students need to get past. Like talking about the Phil Jackson thing, like, you know, Phil Jackson's job, you know, as the coach for the for his team for the Bulls back then was not to play every practice, play every player one on one to prove that he's worth coaching them now. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. His strength is in his coaching. And I have to remind myself as I get older, Sheena will tell me, she'll say, professor, you got to be there tomorrow. Like, don't kill yourself tonight. Your students need you. So I let her be that friendly reminder for myself that like, yeah, I want to roll with my students, but like, I can't engage my ego either and make it like that. I got to like kick their ass or I have something to prove to somebody too. Sure. Well, and for us in our own game, how do we roll with somebody who uh, we don't necessarily want to roll with? And maybe it's that We do find a way to create parameters for ourselves so that we can roll together. Or if we're not able to roll together, maybe we're able to drill together or like work on a certain technique or, you know, something together so we can at least uh, partner and move together in in a way that's good for everybody. Right. Yes. What do you think about the statement? I've heard this at different points in my um, in my jujitsu journey, like the way you roll. Well we're kind of introducing maybe a competing aspect to this, but you, you're going to compete the way you roll, like you, the way you roll in the gym. And if you're going, you know, light, you wind up competing, you know, you, you're not going as hard in competition. Um, the affiliation that I was part of originally was like huge on that. It's like, it was like, go hard, hard. Like it was fight sports. So it was, you know, cyborg at the top, kill, 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 kill. You know, it was always like, go hard, go hard. And if you were rolling light, you know, people would be like, no, you, you know, you're going to fight like that in the street. You're going to fight like that in competition. But I mean, there's like a, a there's a point like you, you can't maintain that, especially if you're not doing this professionally. But it was yeah. preached to everyone, regardless of why you were there, whether you were just a hobbyist, you were competing or you, you know, wanted to do this as a living. Um, what do you think about that statement? What, what do you tell people uh, if you if, when you hear something like that? What would you say? So there's 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 two aspects to this, like. First, like, you know, as a competitor, I was always taught that you save something for the day of competition. Like that was always kind of my training modality. Like if I put it all on the mats and I get to the competition and I'm not at 100 percent, like that's a huge problem. Getting to a competition at 95 to 100 percent is a huge feat in and of itself. And if you can actually do that, you're probably going to be that much further ahead of all the other competitors competing. So there's that aspect of it, like leave something for the day of competition if you are a competitor. The second part of that, there's been a move now in mixed martial arts for like fighters to do not do full contact sparring like in the gym. Mm -hmm. It's more like a light tap sparring and then guys saving everything for the day of competition. And actually even in Muay Thai, they, they spar that way most of the time. It's like this light kind of tapping sparring and then it's actually full spar on the day of competition. And why would people do that? Because exactly what you're saying. It's not sustainable. Yeah. Like you can't continue that. Yeah. We use different parts of our brain when we are fighting and in survival mode versus when we are learning and playing. So mm-hmm. if you want to access those regions of your brain, those cognitive thinking skills, you need to do it from a place of calm. And if you are taught in a way, survive, 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 go, go, go. And then you go and compete that way. You are forced now to think and operate at a level that is not significant enough to get you that win, to get you that medal, especially when you're competing. That's the most important part to keep your wits about you and to keep that cleverness so that you can have the strategies available to you and access to them to be able to breathe and to stay calm and to think it's when you're not able to do that, that you're going to get yourself in trouble. And think about how that even like ages you like that kind of constant, like stress hormones Mm -hmm. all the time. Every time you're rolling, you're going to age in dog years, like for your (laughs) jujitsu, like you're going to, you're just going to, you know, you're going to get older quicker. Like you're not, your jujitsu journey is not going to be fun for you. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely see, uh, you know, for me, my journey, I really want to be doing this for a long time. I turned 50 this past year. 
I'm like, I don't feel, I don't feel 50 in here, in here, but sometimes the body, like in my heart, I don't feel 50 in my head. I don't feel 50 it, my body, you know, after a couple of training sessions, can, I could really feel it. Um, what are your thoughts on, I know for me, very, you know, every couple of months, it winds up just happening. Life happens and I got to take a week off. I kind of, I tell people like, it's kind of, it's such a good thing. Like it's okay to take a week off or take a long weekend. You don't have to train every day, especially when you're getting older, because you're just going to, you are ju- it's not sustainable. And you know, the back hurts and then you don't want to train and then it starts getting your mental. What are your thoughts on, on taking breaks uh, at any level, at any age, but especially when you're older? I think that any kind of like, we're talking about the parameters again, like training can be, there can be different versions of training. It doesn't have to be that like, you go in every day and you roll it crazy hard. Then you do that for a couple of days and your, you know, your body feels like it's just, you know, dead. And then you're trying to do it again and that's not going to work. So maybe there's different parameters you can put on your training. Like maybe today I'm just going to drill. I'm not going to roll, or it's going to be like no rolling Thursday or, you know, I rolled last time. So today I'm going to just practice technique or something like that. I think it's okay to have different versions of your training. Mm -hmm. And so that's on the mats. What about off the mats? Mm -hmm. What is just your lifestyle? Like, just Mm -hmm. because maybe you didn't go train in class that that day doesn't mean that you didn't wake up and stretch. Doesn't mean that you didn't sweat and move your body. Doesn't mean that you didn't go out and get nature and engage in wonderful relationships and evolve your communication skills and get out of your comfort zone a little bit at work and try something new and different, right? That's the point of jujitsu is maybe I'm not training an arm bar today, but I'm training at my business. I'm training at my life. I'm training to be a better person or friend or something like that. So I highly encourage people to take their training off the mats. Just because you didn't spend an hour in class, it doesn't mean that you're not living like a martial artist or that you still can't uh, incorporate and infuse that into your everyday decision making. Like when you go and sit down, like, okay, I know I'm not going to class. I'm taking a break from class. So I'm going to do jujitsu in the kitchen. I'm going to fuel my body so that when I go into class next week, I'm a machine. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, I guess, I would recommend. Yeah, what, I love that. What is your world? Uh, what is your, your world like, or who is your community off the mat? Is it like me who like, I'm sorry, it's all jujitsu. It's all jujitsu people. They've become my friends, my family, my confidants. Um, is it the same with you or do you have people that you know and that are in your life that don't do it? And are those times like a little bit like they don't understand it? You know how we get, we obsess. Yeah, like what is your world of, outside of jujitsu or off the mats? We don't have a ton of people in our life other than yeah, like immediate point. family that are like non jujitsu. Pretty much everybody else that we talk to is either a student, a friend or someone that I'm friends with in the jujitsu community or something like that. Like we don't have a ton of, non jujitsu friends it's like it always reminds me too like when i was in the military like when you're in the military you're like a soldier and everybody else is a civilian right because yeah. they're not in the military i feel like jujitsu can feel like <laughs> I, like we do jujitsu then everybody else is a civilian like the normies what is it is it uh cool. is it like harry potter i don't i'm not a big fan of those movies it was a little bit after my time but what do they call them like normies or something like is this like sure. you know somebody who's outside of, <laughs> of our world yeah, it's something I yeah. can't relate to non-jujitsu people. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't. I don't even want to say like I have more respect for jujitsu people, but I guess I probably do in some some way. I guess I don't know. I feel well, like I, I, I think like even if we don't have a big like a bunch of uh, everybody, you know, jujitsu, jujitsu. It's like we could go anywhere in the world, and we have that family. We yeah. can go online, and we have that community. So it's like, uh, and that's with anybody, right? So. Yeah. Uh, no matter what your world may or may not have in it, it, it is really special because there there are these relationships, you know? Sure. So, uh, yeah, but us, basically, it's jujitsu 24-7. <laughs> so that's going to lead us to the retreat, but I have one other question. Yeah. What is it like, like, do you guys, like, okay, you're married, you know, there's going to be these little arguments in any relationship. How have you, how are you able to handle that? Like on and off the mat? Are there days where you've, you know, I I've talked to couples. I, I always ask this question because I've talked to couples to be like, we could be mad at each other. And sometimes we get it out in a role. Like uh, we'll yeah. get on the mats. Uh, Tubby Aliquin and her husband, Eric talked about like they, they'd be mad at each other. And then they'd be like, let's get on the mat or they're, 
they're in class and then it's like their time they're the two that need to roll together like everybody's matched up and they roll and they wind up sometimes it gets intense but most of the time the anger like it's over after that roll have you guys experienced anything like that is that what happens with you or like talk to us about that a little bit I mean, definitely in the past, we had those kind of roles. I don't know that we do that as much anymore, but we used to, de I definitely remember some roles where we're like, we were like maybe mad at each other that day. And then we got on the mats and no one said anything and we rolled and we like kicked each other's asses. And then we were like, fine with it. Yeah, yeah it, we got that energy out. Um, but then, you know, I, yeah, it, it's kind of gotten to the point with Mike and I now where I, I feel like our roles are very, uh, they're technical and we uh i don't i don't know that we're mad at each other a lot <laughs> no but we and we but we roll like we roll hard on each other like we definitely like it's a different role with sheena than it is anybody else and mostly because she just like it's kind of annoying actually because she knows she's my first black belt but she knows like my jujitsu so well and me so well that she just does weird shit that like that I, I can't even like get her to go into my guard or even like get my legs. You know what I mean? Like there's just yeah. stuff with her that's just so different in the role than other people, you know? And it's kind of annoying actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to like not show her everything. I need to like sh turn the funnel <laughs> off for a minute. Yeah. That's great. Now he's, she's showing me stuff. So, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? The student has become the no, teacher. No, whatever works. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The student becomes yeah. the teacher. If it yeah. works for you and your relationship, do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So let's talk about the retreat. We're talking about community and the retreat. How's everything going with the, with the, like, you know, kind of the bookings. This is, uh, tell everybody the, like where it is, the date, like, you know, give us as much information as you can. And I'm already signed up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, super excited. So We're excited. Gonna be you have no clue. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be right November 14th through the 19th. It's at heroesbjj.com. That's where you can go check it out. Or you can go on our any of our BJJ After 40 sites and you'll see it on there. But yes, it's going to be really, really awesome. We're super excited about it. And we actually have people who uh, they're going to be training and they're bringing somebody who is not going to be training. Yeah, so sure. uh, it's coming with, with like spouses and stuff like that. They're non-trainers, but that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the fun part too, because there'll be a lot of cool like non jujitsu excursions and things that we'll do that we can all do together then there will be you know a few hours of training every day and some really good good breakout sessions on nutrition and mobility and flexibility and all that good stuff too Gi and nogi Gi and nogi and so, tons of jujitsu like yeah. yeah we're really excited about you have both of us two black belts yeah Woo. so what what do you uh, is it like uh you just kind of mentioned a couple of things are is there like a curriculum basically that you're coming into it with like we know we're going to accomplish these things during our sessions. Yeah, like we have a framework to it, but I'm always like, you know, I try to be adaptable within that framework too, based on like who we have, the belt levels that are there, kind of what we're doing. But yeah, we have specific objectives that we want to reach, and and we the biggest thing is we want you guys to leave with ev with everything and more than what was there. Like, you know, how many times do you go to a seminar and like you. They do a bunch of techniques all day, then you leave and you remember one thing. Our goal is for people to remember everything and then have your mm -hmm. own sense of aha moments, your own sense of awakenings, and then leave the camp with a renewed vigor and be able to go into your life like unlike you were before, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, not just strategies for like, like kind of like we're saying, like you go into a seminar and it's, oh, I learned this move. We want to give you a more holistic perspective of jujitsu, just like we incorporate with our life. So uh, the mental, the emotional uh, aspects and how to learn, how to really understand your learning style so that you can apply it when, you, when you're done with the seminar, when you go home, so that you have all of these tactical things that you got from the seminar that you can take, the submissions and the, the chains and the sequences, but you also have um, just a better understanding of how you can learn from your instructors, or if you're a coach or a, a professor, an instructor, you can learn how to teach better as well um, and, and continue that evolution uh, beyond the seminar, ideally. And be okay. a better student, learn better, how to assimilate the techniques quicker mm -hmm. and all of the little hacks that we figured out. In fact, we have a book coming out here shortly, the BJJ After 40 Survival Guide will be out this week. 
And within that book, like we poured our heart and soul into that. And that book has a lot of those strategies that a lot of the stuff that we'll be covering at the camp, but like with us in detail, hitting all the key points. And, and as far as the retreat, right, I know that uh, I don't know if I read this or if you said this to me, maybe I saw it in a post. You don't have to be over 40 to come to the retreat, right? To, if you're a jujitsu <laughs> practitioner and you are under 40, you are very much welcome, right? Yeah, and that's kind of like what we talked about earlier with the BJJ before 40. Like it mm -hmm. starts in your, you know, starts wherever you are now. Like starting those habits and doing those things now is going to make a huge difference in your whether you're going to be 35, 40, 45, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, so it's open Absolutely. to everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Now let's let's talk a little bit more about the book. What wh what inspired this? Was this something uh, a long time in the making? Did somebody ask you to write it or did you guys just think like, I think, you know, it's time to kind of let's start writing some of these things down. How did that start? How did the process start? Kind of both of that, like, you know, it's a lifetime, literally lifetimes in the making in the sense that like I put we both did. We put everything into this book that we would want any practitioner of jujitsu to learn everything on the mats, off the mats, all of the mental aspects of training. So it has like literally everything that we would want to incorporate for you into your training. What we found was we have these platforms where people, regardless of their age, adults are coming and they're interested in doing jujitsu or they're doing jujitsu. And a couple of things were happening when they would come on the platforms. They would be really excited and like really involved uh, pretty quickly, right? And it would either be one of two things. One, uh, I got injured and what do I do? Or um, how do I not get injured? <laughs> and it was to the point where there were so many questions. Um, yeah, and it was kind of like either like I can't, I can't go to everybody's school and like, you know, change your school. I can't even really do that at all. <laughs> and I can't bring everybody here. So like for us was like, how do we, how do we get the, all of the information, all of the lessons, all of the things that we've learned in the past for me, like, you know, martial arts for 40 plus years, how do we get all of this information to people that are doing jujitsu? And so that was the impetus of the book was, you know, putting all of this together. But then the other aspect of the book is we, yes, we wrote, a large majority of the book. Um, it's about 320 pages. We also brought in other experts from other fields to contribute to the book. So we have 12 other experts that are from, mm -hmm. you know. It, not just jujitsu, but CEOs, fitness experts. Uh, we wanted to fill it with just the understanding that we want everybody to try to train. So not like a certain affiliation, but just the flag of jujitsu um so trying to find people that would help you do that that are going to help you stay on the mats that are going to stay injury free and so you know, i wanted to have a multimedia experience so like i'm a kind of visual auditory kinesthetic learner like i like to watch videos i like to hear do them i like to do it all right <laughs> yeah. like that's just kind of how my brain it's hard for me to just sit down and read a book i can do it but i can do it in short spurts so we incorporated a multimedia aspect in the sense that there's qr codes throughout the mm. entire book tons of them and all of our experts our survival experts also contributed videos as well so there's stuff from like like, you know, videos you can scan and watch right there while you're reading the book, stuff on like visualizations, um, affirmations. So there's some really cool visualiz visualizations, if I can say it, <laughs> <laughs> that are great for like, let's say you're the guy that gets super nervous before you go to class or you're freaking out when you get to class. So there's these great little visualiza visualizations. And I then can. there's like home workouts. There's techniques and drills. Yes, and... So all kinds of so the QR codes are throughout the book. So there's that whole multimedia aspect to it, in addition to the regular book as well. Mm -hmm. Which is very much Mike's style. It goes back to how how we like to learn. And especially as adults, uh, we grow up as kids being in a school and being taught how to learn. And then as adults, we're not really taught that anymore. And uh, doing this thing that we love 
Uh, we want to be able to retain this information and maintain it, right? So having a way to not just get it to you through one source, like just the written word, but if you're the type of person who likes to listen, if you're the type of person who likes to watch a video, um, because that's my true to his essence and core. And most people don't just learn one way. Most people like uh, a little bit of everything here, just like on the podcast, you can listen to it, you can watch it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so having that throughout the book now is really cool and, and special because that's that's just us. <laughs> yeah. So now you you guys uh, have a have a couple of munchkins, right? Uh, you've got some small some small children. Are they what are their ages? Are they under ten, or one of them's under ten? Well, we have uh, 17, 14, and three-year-old twins. And oh my God, three-year-old twins! <laughs> sorry Four for kids. the sorry for the oh my God. I was like three-year-old twins. Wow, it's okay, it's so, okay. You're okay. You're safe. You're safe. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can give them back. <laughs> so, um, you know how important is this? You know, uh, oh, first of all, who's training? Is are the older kids? Uh, do they train, or uh, is every the whole family so, on the mat? Our oldest daughter, uh, she took a break to start high school. She had been homeschooled her whole life, and uh, she started high school, so she took a break, and now she's kind of getting back into it. Um, our fourteen-year-old son is really interested in kind of getting back into it and competing. Uh, so I think both of us just want to get him through high school uh, and see where that goes. And then our three-year-old twins, um, I imagine they'll be wanting to. Yeah. Like it's, start. you know, it's, it's like starting and, you know, it's not like really starting with the kids because our kids have jujitsu is always in our life. So yeah. You know, our little ones, you know, their play area is our dojo. Like it's, yeah. you know, like that's their life. Like their life is on the mats. Their life is seeing jujitsu. Their life is keys and, you know, rash guards and all of that. So even though they're not in class yet, like it's very much part of their essence. And I'm sure I can't imagine a reality where they're not doing jujitsu. Like yeah. they're just, you know, they're bred and born for it. I, I heard some early Gracie uh, interviews, Henner and, and Hidon talking about, how before they were really on the mats, they were they played jujitsu at home with their with their dad. Like yeah. again, it, it kind of creeps into every aspect. They, when they're home playing, he would be like, he knew you know, dad knew what he was doing. Like they're playing and they're passing his guard and he's on his back and they're trying to jump on him. Right? They, they you know, does, is that happening for you now? Is it like you play with them and it always like kind of gears into that jujitsu play a little bit? Yeah, of course. And and when they play, you know, it's interesting with twins too because you have like these two little three-year-olds running around, they're about to be four in a week and they're, they will start wrestling with each other. So sometimes we have to come in and kind of break it up. Sometimes we'll let them just kind of play for a minute. But the interesting thing to watch is like how intuitive jujitsu is for them. Like you watch them and you're like, he just did a back take on or a takedown on her and she just took his back. That's so crazy. Look at her putting this belt on. You know what I mean? And they haven't, we've never shown them stuff. We don't show yeah. them techniques. But I think there's just something true to the 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 instinctive, natural like state of our body that we like we do jujitsu, like wrestling is so natural for people. Like yeah. you see it in like three year olds, they just start doing jujitsu. It's crazy. It's so intuitive. Mm -hmm. Sheena, you mentioned homeschooling before. Were were uh, was your daughter homeschooled because of jujitsu, because she was on the mats? Was that something outside so, had nothing to do with jujitsu? Because I see that happening a lot. That I have there mm -hmm. my my coach's son is homeschooled because his life is jujitsu and uh, we have like our front desk girl, same thing. Her, uh, her husband is a coach. She runs the front desk and one of their children is, is homeschooled and his, he is the first uh, uh, fight to win children's champions. The first time they ever give a belt to a child. So he's actually just won that recently. So like their lives are jujitsu, but they're primarily homeschooled. I believe because of jujitsu, what, what, what is your story behind the homeschooling? Yeah. For Mike and I, uh, that was that was our job. So the only way we would be able to see our kids is if they were on the mats with us. So our two older kiddos, our 17 and our 14 year olds, they literally lived on the mats with us. Um, so during the day, it was school. And then during the night, uh, they were training, we were teaching and training. And uh, that's how that's all we've ever known. Um, so 
when our kids decided and our older kids decided to start high school these last couple of years, that's been a new adventure for us. But um, getting to have the homeschool route where you incorporate jujitsu into your physical education, it's pretty mm -hmm. spectacular yeah. <laughs> Just on, a, on a personal bias, you know, um, and and we we get to see like it's rad because like part of the homeschool is like, OK, you have to learn how to do your laundry, which means washing your gi for the next day. Um, so mm -hmm. once again, it's like those lines are blurred when it's it's this deep in jujitsu. It's like mm -hmm. less about um, going and training a class. It's more about living that certain lifestyle and getting to be just that type of person that yeah. is looking through the lens of a martial artist. Uh, so in anything we do, whether it's school or communicating, like talking to somebody, anything we do, it's, it's through, um, or as a jujitsu practitioner. So, uh, that's just kind of been yeah. us individually, yeah. collectively, and as a family. Mm -hmm. Will your, will you, so the, the two older are now going to, a, to school, they're going to a public school or go somewhere mm -hmm. for school. They're no longer homeschooled, both of them. Yeah, they decided uh, to start, yeah, for the first time ever in, in high school. So yeah, it was like the crazy part for that was like they went from like full time host homeschool in their entire life, mm -hmm. never really ever being in a school before in the sense Step of like being in a classroom, <laughs> like, you know, having like that traditional school experience, like never, ever daycare, anything, none of nothing. it. And so like, I was more freaked out than them. Like yeah. my son, this last year, this was his <laughs> first year. And like, he, you know, he's 14. And I was like, Sheena, he's going to be sitting alone at lunch. Kids are going to make fun of him and stuff. And it was like the complete opposite of that. Yeah. She's like, kids don't do that in lunch anymore. They have phones. And it's not like, yeah. this isn't like the 1980s. It's not your high school. <laughs> he's, got, he's like the best kid ever. Like he's got an entire network of friends. He's got an entire social thing. And But the fact that we yeah. were able to homeschool, like, I, yeah. And I think we gave them a really good homeschool experience in the sense that they, they never were like, these kids who were like children of the corn or something in secluded <laughs> in their basement or something, you know, they were like yeah. in the jujitsu school around other kids. They're like super social kids and they're great kids. And they, and what I think is cool about it for them is that they didn't get to high school with like 10 years already or eight years or something of schooling and burned out on it. They were like excited about high school and they're excited about homework and they're kind of like, yeah. you know, like little nerds about that, but like, you know, well, like and it was their choice. It was their choice to do this. Yeah. And they had, they, you know, they like playing sports and doing yeah. stuff too. So it's really cool to see them have that like really balanced experience because I used to think like I came from the era where homeschool kids were kind of creepy and weird and like, you know, it's just yeah. not like that anymore nowadays. I think it's pretty common, especially like post pandemic more than ever. Yeah. We, uh, when we were teaching martial arts, we were going into elementary schools all of the time. And we, again, like before we were married and had kids, we were both like into homeschooling just in general, like if we ever did have kids. And then when it came time for us to walk that walk. Uh, yeah, just the lifestyle works better. Like I wouldn't want to be like working all day and then not, and not be able to ever see my kids like at night and stuff like that because or working all night teaching martial arts and not see my kids because like you know so it was nice to have them home during the day being at the school with us and bonding and spending that time together and i liked having that quality of people that like yeah my kids do see people coming in and getting out of their comfort zone and training and working hard and uh, making an investment in themselves and, uh, their families. Yeah. And so it was, it's always been a really good experience for us to get to, uh, provide that for that type of life for our kids. Yeah. I see in the, in the kids in my, in, uh, in my school, um, so many of the parents, so many of the kids, the parents wind up training after the kids have started. It's just kind of, right. It's a thing. The kids are there. You're talking to the parents. You're like, come to the adult class. It happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, they've become, you know, they work at the school now or they coach or whatever. Um, do the, the kids in your school, like, it, well, let me finish it. In mine, I see that the kids, even if they're in different elementary schools from some of the surrounding towns, but they all come to jujitsu at our place. It's crazy. Like they're all, such good friends. Like, yeah, they have their friends in school. 
But the jujitsu kids are their circle of friends. These guys, they hang out. They sleep over at each other's houses. They go to movies. They go to places together. We, the school does a summer camp, so that gets them even closer, you know, just kind of outside of that, just the jujitsu side. Do you find that with with your students? And were your how about your kids when they were training with you? Was it like, again, they're only friends with jujitsu people? Yeah, for a long time with our kids, like they were, you know, at the school all the time. So they were always around other kids that did jujitsu. So they kind of grew up with that. And I think it was really awesome for both of them, too, because my son grew up knowing that, like, girls could kick his ass. Like, would you, <laughs> he had a healthy respect for females, including his mom can kick his ass. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, I think that was really good in terms of taming their egos in a healthy way growing up. And we see it in our own academy where like, you know, like mom and dads, and we have all kinds of families. Most of our students are families or, you know, so they're here with their kids and their kids are hanging out while they're taking class and they're hanging out with the other kids. And I see kids going off and doing things together and having social events. So I think that's what's so great about the jujitsu community for anyone is it literally gives you a place and a community and something to be a part of. And I think it, it's accessible to anyone too. When really. you have uh, like that, cause you have different types of friends, right? But when you have that friend who on the mats has your back maybe, but like out there, they also have your back, right? Yeah. That's like, man, that's so sweet. There's nothing yeah. like that. That's That's the best kind of friend you can have. So getting, whether you're a kid and you have that or our kids have that, or you're an adult yeah. or a parent and you get to experience you having that or your kids having that, um, it, it is a really special relationship totally. just because uh, of what you go through on yeah. the mats or what you see yeah. the other kid or the other person go through um, to get to experience some of the sweeter or easier or just other parts of life together. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes it really, really cool. That really resonates with me because when I was going through my divorce this last year, leaving practice and one of my training partners, there was a couple of guys that would always do this, grabbing me and like checking in with me. And we'd mm -hmm. spend just as much time out in the parking lot talking after class than we did in the gym. And I'd be right. like, wow, we've been out here for over an hour just bullshitting by our cars. And I don't know that they know. And I I don't know that I've ever really expressed, but like the, they helped me, they helped me out so much they don't even know. Like just them listening to me bitch and complain or just getting it out. Uh, outside mm -hmm. of just having gotten a little of that emotional side out on the mat was like invaluable to me. Like it really helped me. So I, that, that absolutely resonates with me. Like, you know, just being there for each other on and off the mat. And again, the, all of my friends, I talk to friends of mine from New York. They're in other States. So they're still in New York. I've got a buddy out in Colorado we talk all the time, but here in Florida, I, everyone is either in MMA or jujitsu more specifically, but then like, you know, and maybe other parts of MMA, but everyone's attached to, to martial arts in some way, shape or form. Um, that leads me to my next question for you guys. Will you, will you homeschool your kids? Will you, the, the, the twins, will they go through that same process or will it be different for them? I think we, we both agree that we want to homeschool and then leave it up to them when they get to high school. Okay. Yeah. I like that we did that with our kids because it like, we kind of have the proof of concept now. <laughs> like, right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this year she's getting ready to go to college and she's very intelligent and she's an awesome kid. And the way that I hear her teachers talk about her it's very inspiring it's like wow like yeah she is a really cool kind of kid and and she does she is outspoken and she believes in herself and i she and i see where all of that came from you know like from jujitsu and all of her training and seeing her like actually do that in high school in the real world is pretty cool and it's very redeeming in the sense that like yeah it was probably smart to homeschool them for the the early stages of their education and then allow them that opportunity in high school to go have that full experience that they want to have. My daughter was a cheerleader. You know what I mean? She did the whole thing. So like, I love that she did the entire high school experience, but on her terms. That's awesome. That's great. All right. So we did get one listener question that I wanted to ask you because this, this one really resonated with me. Um, this is uh, his Instagram handle is got Musees, I think is how you say it. So what are your thoughts on training takedowns after 40? And I want to preface this. My own statement is I deal with this a lot because, you know, a bad back, excuse me, bad lower back. And I'm always like worried about this. So he says, I have back problems and I only drill takedowns, but I never go live. What's your advice to somebody like that, somebody at this age with, with back problems and takedowns? What, what do you tell somebody about, you know, about this? So look at 
first, like, what is like, what are your goals, right? Like, if you're going to be a competitor, like, you know, and you have back problems, then that's you know going to be an issue. Like, maybe you have to pull guard, maybe you can't mm-hmm. do a lot of takedown. So that's, you know, might be something that you can't do. But if you're like a normal person training jujitsu, I think it's important to understand takedowns. Like, here's how we do it. Like, we practice takedowns in class, we drill them, but in a safe way, like no one's slamming anybody. And then there's only so much of it. It can't be like an entire hour of takedowns. So maybe it's a small burst of takedowns. If we want to practice it in more of a functional way, we'll do something like this. So if we taught like single leg takedown that day, then we get to the point where we want to roll. I'll say, all right, guys, you're going to move around. You're going to decide ahead of time who's doing the takedown, who's receiving it. So move around, do some fakes and stuff. You're going to grab the takedown. You're going to let them do the takedown. And then when you, when you hit the ground, then you can start your roll at that point. So again, putting some parameters around the takedowns, still practicing them. But I don't think that really, honestly, anybody over 40, and, and even like, even when I was competing, like I competed in my 40s quite a bit. And I actually got takedowns pretty much like every match. I had one good takedown, like an outside leg trip. That was about it. But I would get it every single time. Did I practice it leading up to the tournaments ever? Probably not. Like I didn't even yeah. do a whole lot of stand up takedowns practice. And again, I would save it for the competition. So there's that aspect of it. But I think like for normal people, hobbyists or whatever, training in a gym, I don't think it's a good idea to do stand up takedowns, resisting 100% and just trying to like get a takedown without like, you know, hurting each other. Because then again, what is the goal? What is the point? If the point is to educate ourselves so we understand the concept, the principles, and then the specific details to achieve that, absolutely, yes. Know your, you know, a basic sweep, know a double leg, know a single leg, know, you know, just a, a maybe a handful a of, take downs, of take downs and that's it, right? Why do you need to be an absolute expert at every single takedown, a hundred percent every single time? Is yeah. that, is that the name of the game here? Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I would see where he could try to figure out the partners who are willing to play around with uh practicing practicing and maybe, and maybe you too like if you have a bad ba- bad back maybe you're not the receiver of the move maybe you're just the person doing the move right so like maybe you can practice the takedowns on the other guys but you're not going to have people actually take you down so i think that's a great way to do it if you do have like a back or a knee issue because it's not worth like compromising your back or making something become chronic and eventually have to have a surgery over just like, because I want to be better at takedowns. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. yeah it can't be like, well, I'm, I'm doing this in spite of the fact that I have a bad back. It's got to be because I have a bad back. I'm, or because I project that nonsense onto your back, your back's do it's holding you up. It's doing jo- a great job all day throughout the day. And as you're sleeping just to do it again the next day. So like, I love my back. It's doing awesome. I just don't want to <laughs> put it through that. Right, we'll, so because of that, I'm going to work these takedowns. We right? always say sustainable means outliving the present moment. Like it has to outlive the present moment. Like I want to do takedowns right now, but it can I tomorrow still? So it's got to outlive the present moment. Gotcha. All right. So we're, uh, we're going to start, get ready to wrap things up, but I'm going to go through what we call with these are like the final questions that we ask. These are the most popular questions that we get. So we put them all at the end of the show. Mike, you've done this with us before. I don't know if we named it this before, but we call it Christian. The drill down. (laughs) We call this the drill down now. So I'm going to go through these questions, uh, you know, maybe about uh, anywhere up to 10 questions that we have, depending on time. Uh, So uh, we're going to ask you both. I want you both to answer these. So Sheena, we'll start with you. Preference, gi or no gi? Gi. Mike, gi. Gi? Okay. (laughs) We're geek people. Yeah. We like both, but yeah. I, you know, prefer geek probably more. So on takedowns, uh, is it takedown or pull guard? Takedown. Takedown. We're old school. Right. Okay. <laughs> Music during rolling. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And then, Gina, you know, what's your go-to? You, you have no control music, of... Yeah. If they say if there's no music, it's like being in a bar with no music. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> We're just talking. <laughs> yeah. I don't care what kind of music. You don't, don't, you don't have a preference? Music. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Go ahead, say that again. That as long as there's music playing, yeah. I'm not like, it yeah, could be literally else. anything. Like, I like a little bit of everything. So, like, 
I could be listening to anything, but there's definitely got to be music. I wouldn't even want to roll without music. That's just weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like to sing. I like, no matter what's on, if I know the, I, I love to sing to my, to my rolling partner, <laughs> especially. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I love when like, a, like the coach has like some music on and then like some slow song creeps in somehow in the playlist. I love that. And then you sing to your partner. It's great. Like taking her back. <laughs> Just whispering in their it's ear. Like, no. Or even if I'm getting somebody's on my back and I'm singing to them, they're just like, what the hell? What the hell's going on? This guy's singing. I'm about to choke him. It's weird. Black belt's a weird level. Let's make it weird. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So tell me about annoying things that students do. Give me one each. What's the most annoying thing that you get back from a student when you're training? For me, it's like them talking while we're rolling. That is like, that that drives me crazy. I know some people, it's like a weird nervous tick or something, but it just like the nonstop incessant talking, like the worst is if like you got them in a move and they're trying to coach you on it. That one, that's yeah. just not, like, that's, right. that's not, acceptable. but like no talking. What about for you? Uh, yeah, I guess not just no talking, but like, I don't like when people are doing really good and they're just kind of shitting on themselves. So yeah. I guess that's like, you know, yeah. And like the other you know, people that like, yeah, I don't like that either. That's not cool. Yeah. I, not you'd hate rolling with me. My, I love to talk during my role. Uh, oh, I, no. I think <laughs> it's, it's less about, it's less about, I don't think like a nervous tick. Um, I just, oh I think that I did it at points to like get in their head a little bit, like just to just mess around be like, Oh no, you're, what are you doing? You're not getting that. Oh, yeah, you're yeah, not going to get my wrist. Like I'm narrating the role, but not in a way to like get them to stop. But I think I, like I would mess with them a little bit and yeah. it would like get in their head a little bit, but it was, it just be, it became a fun thing. My coach will yell out and when people are talking, save it for Facebook. And then <laughs> people usually know to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sheena, what would you be doing if you hadn't found martial arts? I think the same thing I'm doing, being a wife and a mom. <laughs> yeah. Mike? Uh, being sad. <laughs> <laughs> being, like, really depressed. I probably would. Like, honestly, like, jujitsu is, like, been the, you know, my medicine for depression. So, like, sure. I would be, you know, I think it, it would be really hard on me to not have jujitsu in my life. I couldn't imagine any reality where it doesn't exist in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but if it wasn't there, that'd be pretty rough. Like that'd be, yeah. I'd be pretty, rough. I don't know if we'd be here together, you know, yeah. honestly. Wow. Um, do you guys, I mean, I, you're, you're, I know that you're involved with, you know, the, the BJJ after 40 brand and you wrote the book and you're doing the retreat. What is, what do you guys do outside of jujitsu for fun? Or is it just more things that relate to jujitsu? <laughs> We like skateboarding, you know, as a family, like we like to ride our skateboards and we like to do things outside with our kids. So we're really kind of outdoors, kind of more natural people, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then the like you said, it, the, our kids are the rest of our life. So uh, if it's not jujitsu, it's our family. And yeah. yeah, trying to trying to be outside is really nice. And yeah. Colorado is the perfect place to do that. Yeah. Did you guys like when the kids were little, uh, you have the, the two little ones now when the kids were little, did did they do things outside of jujitsu? Were they able you're, you're homeschooling? So I don't know that like s school sports are readily available. I think some some places like, yeah, you could be homeschooled and then like join a team. Did they do any of that when they were growing up? Or was it, you know, again, like gym class with jujitsu outside of, you know, homeschool is over more jujitsu was it like that our big thing has always been making sure our kids have music dance and jujitsu in their life like mm -hmm. we've always wanted to introduce those three things so like our teenage daughter was always into guitar like she's taking guitar lessons her whole life and she's a singer and plays guitar so she's always been super into music our son presley who's 14 is really really into latin dancing and and uh break dancing so that's kind of his whole I saw whole you world. post a video the other day. I saw that. Yeah, okay. He's like, that's damn, dude. Like, he likes, and it was kind of a surprise to us, honestly. Like, he did Latin dancing when he was really little, like when he was like, what, five or six or something. Mm -hmm. And then there was only one other boy at the time. So he couldn't get into it and he didn't want to do it after a while. But then when he was older, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, he came to us and said he wanted to go back to dance again. But now he's like, you know, a teenage boy and there's all kinds of girls there. And, 
And, then, and there's more boys dancing now too. So now it's like right now he's kind of got figured out. He's now he's 14 and he's a nice looking kid and and he break dances and he can Latin dance. And so yeah, yeah he's got a big, you know. We always knew that we were like, listen, I appreciate Latin dance. When he's like 15, 16, 19 years old, he's gonna love this. So yeah. oh god, yeah. Like, I mean, what girl doesn't love a guy that dances, right? <laughs> it's always, like I said, I, we've always wanted them to have music dance and jujitsu in their life in some form mm -hmm. that's great all yeah. right this is uh our very last question dun, dun, dun. um i don't know if sheena knows it we're gonna let sheena go first because mike you've answered this more than a couple of times do you or do you not wash your jujitsu belt oh man you know <laughs> i never used to wash it because i didn't want to lose the mojo right yeah. like you can't you can't lose the juju but uh yeah like after i think 15 years this guy uh made me start washing my belt yeah. so i can wash the belt now <laughs> and i honestly don't i would say like i don't wash it as much as i should like i mean yeah i would love to say that i wash it every time but i probably wash it every few weeks or even once a month sometimes i don't wash it nearly as much as i should um, but I definitely think people Everyone's should wash your belt. Like yeah, it's you not, wash it's not immune to bacteria. Like that's yeah. crazy. And I know people get so passionate about that. It's so kind of strange to me, but like, yeah, you definitely got to wash your shit. It's another part of your yeah. gi, dude. You got to wash it. And then uh, you got to make up for it because yeah. you lost it. <laughs> <laughs> so I just so full disclosure, I've always, I've washed every belt that I've ever had. I've pretty much almost, except for white belt, I had two belts. So I always had two belts uh coach would give me one and then with the, with the podcast or even my coach would be like hey this is a great band, brand buy this this belt but uh, flow and roll pretty much has been with us since I was a purple belt so I always had the one that I got promoted in and then flow and roll would would send me one uh, so I have not washed my black belt yet I've had it since December since December I have not washed it yet, but I do spray it with either Lysol or we had a sponsor, Neutral Zone Clean. So we've I have lots of like bottles and sprays and stuff. So I always spray it. I take it, I hang it, I spray it. So I've done that because other people have told me, well, do this if you really want to keep it clean. So I haven't washed it yet. I will wash it. But it's like When's the, the one Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's just the one where it's <laughs> like I want I do want this one to last as long as possible. There is, I guess, something special about this belt more than any of the other belts. Like you knew you were gonna get another belt. Um, even though like flow and roll is going to send me like an embroidered belt with my name, he's working on it. Um, I just, I want this one to last and, you know, and not fall apart. And this is right. I guess conceivably, I guess at my age, I'm, I don't know that I'll ever see a coral belt, you know? Uh, no, but you... I, this is it. So I, I just want this one to last as long as I definitely want to wash it. And it's already, uh, there were about four of us that got promoted at the same time. So we all got black belt and we were all a threes and it's already happened where, the, our belts have come off and we're just grabbing it. We're like, is this mine? Is it yours? Nobody knows. Know. They all look the same. Nobody's washed them yet. So I could conceivably have come home with another belt. I just put a little marker on mine now. I put a little marker, a mark on the red. Uh, there's like the, or the or excuse me, the patch. There's like uh, the name of the belt. And I colored in some of the letters just so I can see, like, I know which one's mine. But yeah, I haven't watched it. I will. I will though. I'm a belt washer. I'm an advocate for belt washing. So you can always uh, buy another belt. Just remember yeah, that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. There's a little something special about this one. You know, I gotta get over it. <laughs> Listen, I, when I, my when know, my flow and so, roll one comes, I'll I'll wash this belt. When I got my first black one, I was like, Oh, I don't wanna drop it. I don't wanna it, this is like I was, you know, like everybody at first. And then one time I went home, I was driving home one night during a rainstorm. I got home and I realized that my belt was out the car door dragging the entire way home dude just, just hopping down the road like just, dude. The shame. it was the shame. covered in mud it was all shitty looking i was like oh my god what is wrong with me wow what yeah. belt was that what which one that was what my belt? my original black belt, that was your original one that black belt. I, oh, I got wow. after being a brown belt for 13 years and i dragged yeah. it all the way home but, what are you going to do, dude? Just go get a new belt. So let me give you guys an opportunity. Uh, we've talked about the book. If you want to, you know, any shout outs that you want to give to anybody, say hello, thank yous, sponsors, anything. Now's your time. Thank you to Feito IT and AV, specializing in commercial and residential automation, security cameras, CCTV, POS, and more. Check them out at feitoitav.com or call 305-428-2515 and let them know the dummy sent you.
Special thank you to the crew over at Flow and Roll for all their support. Flow and Roll is renowned for their incredible Nogi rash guards, shorts, and leggings. Flow and Roll has quickly become the premier custom apparel provider for academies big and small throughout the United States. Reach out today to discuss your custom order and ask about their incredible pre-order program. You can send an email to flowenroll at gmail.com or visit their Instagram at flow underscore n underscore roll and shoot them a direct message. And yes, they can create an awesome custom gi for your academy as well. Visit flowenroll.com to check out their awesome designs and while you're there, pick up a jujitsu dummy signature tee exclusively at flowenroll.com. And remember, you'll get 20% off your purchase of t-shirts, rash guards, or gis with code JJD. Yes, so like, you know, obviously everybody check out the book, which is going to be out in another week, the BJJ After 40 Survival Guide, which will be available on Amazon. I also want to announce, too, we just created a collaboration with X Marshall. They're okay. going to be carrying a line of BJJ After 40 Rash Guards. They got all these dope-ass designs that are going to be coming out this week, so that's going to be through xmarshall.com, xmarshall. Yeah, familiar with the brand. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah stuff yeah so yeah that's yeah check out the book dude it's going to be amazing i can't wait to share it with the world well i'm uh, sheena do you have anything ned no oh, that's, that's it. It was okay so nice to meet you. Uh, I'm, I'm uh you guys are like uh your your love of jujitsu is contagious mike it's, we've talked what three times now on the podcast uh, I, I always look forward to these um you uh, your take on jujitsu is is kind of in line with the way i feel about jujitsu so i love talking to you about it I'm so excited to see you guys in Costa Rica. Um, maybe, uh, maybe I will by then. Maybe I'll be bringing a guest with me. I don't know. Maybe you know. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we're rooting for you. Dude. Or, or maybe I meet somebody there that that's as passionate about jujitsu and single. <laughs> so, so thank you uh, again. Look, I always appreciate. Look, anytime you want to come on, this like I, if you're ever in Florida, please come in. There's yeah. we have plenty of room here for for two or three people. So I'd love to have you guys in studio one day. But I'm absolutely like this is my booked vacation that I I love having a goal, and my yeah. like I'm just looking at that schedule. Like in November, I'm like this is the thing that I'm going to be prepared to go to. So I'm That's super excited good. about that. So thank you for coming on. Anytime you want to come on, like we definitely have to come up when you get the book and we got the jacket. We can we can help you promote it a little bit, uh, whether it's in the next couple of months or sooner. Like you know, it is, we're always open for you. So um, sounds good. Thank you everybody for watching and listening. You can check us out at Jujitsu Dummies uh, for all the ways to watch, listen, and support. Uh, my, uh, my personal IG is uncle Milty BJJ. Uh, thank you to Bo who always does our post-production and we didn't get to have him in studio today, but we, uh, we miss you. And, uh, thank you, Christian as well. Uh, thank you everybody for watching and listening. Peace, love, jujitsu. Oh,